he was wanting to add some of my items, some of my daggers per se, because it fitted the character. You know, when you're thinking about a lot of assassins and your James Bond type people. Again, it's another sort of action thriller, undercover CIA, you know, that, that type of film. John's work for Hollywood. He does an awful lot for charity. They'll take that actual dagger itself and they'll make like a, a silicon mold. Handling my weapon. Hello, legends. I hope this finds you absolutely wonderful. I'm delighted to be joined today by John Hamilton of Hamilton Daggers Glasgow. John is an incredible craftsman. His work is certainly a lot better than my first attempt at knife making. John's work for Hollywood. He does an awful lot for charity, creates these, these works of art that then get all auctioned off by the veterans charities etc etc i'm very proud to be a patron um of john's company and um, thank you for that mate gosh john before we talk about how you got into this can we go straight into the hollywood thing because that's i just find that fascinating that you've been involved in in the filmmaking and one of the photos you sent me was of the bong girl olga kurilenko yeah. Who, who was the Bond girl in Quantum of Solace. Yeah, I've seen photos of her. Am I allowed to say han handling your work? Yeah, han handling my weapon. Handling <laughs> my weapon. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm very privileged, Chris, to, as we get older, we get to know a lot of individuals. And I've got a, a very good friend of mine who's a, a director in Hollywood at the moment called Jesse Lee Johnson. He produced quite a lot of films and he was aware of what I was doing when obviously I originally started. And because he does a lot of action and adventure films type of thing, usually mainly the action, he was wanting to add some of my items, some of my daggers per se, because it fitted the character. You know, when you're thinking about a lot of assassins and your James Bond type people and covertly done in street alleyways and, and, and you, you, know, you know what I mean at night time mm, mm. all these things kind of fitted in so I was more than happy to oblige because like I say he's a friend anyway so I produced a couple of uh, first part and daggers the very very first batch that I ever done and I sent her through uh, across a couple to Los Angeles where they were received obviously you see the real dagger in the films but clearly for the films they get the the costume department, I'll call them. They'll take that actual dagger itself and they'll make like a, a silicon mould for the more dangerous parts. And then obviously Hollywood takes over and they'll add the blood, etc., etc. But the good thing about it is most of the actual physically holding it in a lot of the shots is actually the real dagger, you know. Obviously they've been cut to, you know, when something had to happen, etc. So Jesse's been fundamental, actually, in the, in the break in. I think we... With any adventure that you go on or anything you're thinking about doing, you have to have that breaking point. And that's usually the the fight or flight, isn't it? It either works or it doesn't work type of thing. So it was quite nice to have Jesse who basically opened the doors for me. And since then, the daggers have been basically shown in, I think it's about seven or eight films now, you know, all over the place. And he's actually, he's just done another couple uh, in Budapest. Again, it's another sort of action thriller, undercover CIA, you know, that, that type of film. And there's another couple of daggers that I've sent across that is actually, uh, he's been shown in the films as well to use it. Because here's the thing, that's what they're designed for, the classic stilettos. And it's those kind of individuals that would have used them, not so much back in the day, still today, if that makes sense, because nothing's changed, you know. Well, 
Well, we we chatted about this, didn't we? You said that you had Royal Marines and and fellow commando or other commandos by your commissions to yeah, yeah, yeah. T- to take to Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm very privileged uh, now in my latter years. Like yourself, we, we know a lot of individuals, obviously being a commando myself, or ex-commando now, because obviously my, my time's done. I've done 25 years. But through the, the brotherhood, shall we say, you get to know a lot of different people, and a lot of different people get to know you. Mm. So then before you know, when you start opening things up like Facebook groups and stuff like that, you get all these guys who are familiar with somebody else that you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the family builds. And then all, all of a sudden, I was starting to get a lot of messages for the classic range, uh, all black dagger. So we've got the second part on roped and ribbed, fat boys or fat men, whatever you want to call them, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And a lot of these guys were going on operations. Uh, quite a lot of the guys are probably based around the pool area. Uh, the pool area. You've got the SF signals, you've got the SB boys that are down there as well. Uh, 148 Commando Battery, part of 29 Commando, they're down there. And yes, a lot have went in that direction. But not just specifically in that uh, niche SF world. Your normal commando units as well, 45, 42, 40, uh, 29 Commando. I'm going to say 59 because 59 was my time, but... I, I think now they're, they're, they're renamed to, so it could be 30 Commando or something like that. They're, they've got a new title that I'm not really aware of because I'm not in anymore, so I don't really pay attention to it. Mm. Commando Log, everybody, mm. everybody's been doing it because the guys are operational now, and as we very well know, uh, warfare's changed. You know, it's it's not the conventional warfare that, that I would have been more familiar with d- during my time fighting a known enemy in a uniform, etc., now it's a kind of you're in ravines in the middle of Af- Afghanistan and things like that, and then you're moving into cave complexes where there's no ambient light, and all you've got is them, you know that mm-hmm. type of thing. There's guys, there's Hereford boys that I've spoke to, and I've sent some that way as well. They were telling me stories about Tora Bora and things like that. I've known guys through my career from those backgrounds that we've discussed at length stories about Tora Bora, for example, and things that happened there. And unfortunately, some of the mental health issues that people get when they come back from places like that due to the climate that they find themselves in, hence the reason why they use what they use to get you know the job done. John, how, if you served so long, where was, where was the time to pick up the skills to, to get into knife making? There wasn't, and I didn't. That, that, that's the whole thing. I had... Left the military, I'd had uh, one one or two daggers, you know, during my service type of thing. Nothing fancy, just what it was. Most of the time it was things that you came across. Uh, And I got out and everybody reaches that crossroads when you get out. You don't really quite know what to do or where you want to go. But because I was quite a high rank when I got out, I had decided quite early on, whilst I was still in, at the latter stages, that I was going to keep away from the the turmoil of life, shall we say, and try and settle down a little bit in a bit of quiet time, try and enjoy myself, you know. Mm. So then I got to thinking about not so much knife making per se. I wanted something to collect. I got into a little bit of history, special commando history. I started learning about it. I started meeting people, veterans, et cetera, et cetera. I started collecting some World War II examples, uh, daggers, which were very, very tactile. And you kind of get that sort of buzz off them when you when you hold them in your hand, you know. And I was looking at it and I thought, that's just a shame they don't do these anymore, isn't it? Then I realised it was probably around the world, there was a couple of people that were doing, making one or two things. I thought, well, do you know what? I'm quite a, a handy guy. I, I'm good at stuff, so I might have a go at this. And basically, that's exactly what I did. There was a, a Belgian commando friend of mine sent me an old tattered dagger across and asked me if I could fix it up for him, which I did, and I sent it back to him. And he kind of got the inspiration going because he said, you should do this as a living majesty, hey, whatever, and sort of a laughter off type of thing as you do. But then out walking the dog, as we all do, the big man moments where you do your big man thinking, I thought, hmm, what, what is involved in this? That's okay. We can do this. We can do that. 
Could I do that? Well, there's only one way to do it. You try it, don't you? Initially, friends got on board and supported what I was doing, which was fantastic. And then before you know it, I done a little batch, gone. Straight away, gone. How, how, I mean, your work is just exceptional. Friends, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but John very kindly um, created, I'm not going to say knocked up, because it just doesn't do his work justice, he created this work of art, this beautiful commando dagger. Uh, when I led the Veterans Nine Mile Speed March up there at Aknakari, the home of the, the original home of the commando or Churchill's commandos. And um, so we went out there and smashed out this, uh, the command at the Royal Marines Nine Mile Commando Test some of us are almost 50 years old. And uh, like I say, John very kindly gave us one of his daggers in support that we auctioned off. It made an or we it made over a thousand pounds, John, didn't it? It did, yeah, yeah. It did. It did. The, the bids just I think it was closer to two thousand in the end. The bids just yeah. and a lot of the old old timers, can we say that? <laughs> it just says I'm almost old time on myself, but I think they're just gobsmacked that they can like buy. They have access to actually yeah. buy something that yeah, yeah. that is that is so sort of special to them. And um, it was all I could do, mate, to make this thing right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm very aware it's yeah. You know, I'm a novice. Da 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 da. I had to get all the gear. Friends watching. You can do it cheaper, but that's about two and a half thousand pounds worth of equipment and supplies just mm. to make just to make your first knife. How did you know how to temper stuff and and sharpen it? And you, 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 this is part of the process. And the good thing about being in the military, it gives you that mental way of thinking. I.e., a set of orders analyzing the process. So I basically done a combat estimate if we're ever going to keep it sort of military speak, and I looked at things. Now, obviously. You can get uh, guys or blacksmiths that have already got the forge set up. You can buy uh, little killings for a better word. Or you can go to people who have already got that set up already done. So why go out and buy a killing when you know a company who already owns it because that's what they do. They fabricate steel to certain uh, rock wells, etc. So if you had something produced, then you could take it to them and obviously they will then heat it to the required temperature for you. Show us anything that you've got there, mate, by the way. Is that quite clear? Can you see that okay? Yes. Now, you can see that lovely little bow in that. I appreciate it. it's got the background and you can't see it. That's a blank. That's how the blank gets cut. What type of steel is that, John? That's, that's ASS, ASIS 1085. So it's a carbon steel. It's your classic carbon steel, almost like a tool steel. The reason why we use it is because when it gets hardened for military grades, it has to be fit for purpose. It has to be able to do the job, as we very well know, like bayonets, etc., etc. Daggers have got the exact same uh, principles. We call them daggers. We call them knives. They're actually stilettos, as we were and talked about before. Everything's got a purpose in life. That this is not a gerber. This is not a multi-tool. This is a weapon that's been designed for a specific job. And that job only is something you need to carry. So basically that there gets turned into that there. Now you, that, you'll be familiar with that one, mate, because that's the one that was auctioned off, the first pattern. That, as you can see, comes from that. Mm. I was never sure whether they were made from one single piece of steel, but now yes. you've, you've shown us like that, clearly the handle and the hilt and the... Yeah. Um, what do you call the it finger guard? Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting what you said there because you actually are correct. Yeah, you, you, you're actually you've got quite a mechanical brain, and it's it's actually very good to thinking about this. Hmm. Not everybody does it like that. Some people will do the blade, and part of the tang is just cut, and then it gets welded. They'll they'll, they'll do a, a sort of welded section onto it with a thread on it because during the heating process, things can bend. Hmm. That's all we do with the the thickness of the blade prior to the heat treatment. Does that make sense? If it's too thin, it will bend. So you've got to do like a first grind, first of all. So it's got quite a bit of thickness on it. 
then it'll be heat treated, then it comes back to you. But by doing that, you've then created another monster because now you've only done the first grind and you've got subsequent grinds that have to be done after that. The metal's now hardened. So when it comes to paper-wise and on your belts and on the, the sanders, etc., cetera, the, the grinders, it takes a lot more damage, a lot more effect out of those machines. Whereas in its softened state, it's quite malleable and you can get it to roughly where you want it to be, you know? So you're, you're absolutely correct in what you're saying. Mm. I do it the traditional way, where it's the full tank. Nothing has changed since World War Two. That's the way a blank would have been produced. Then it gets subsequently profiled, you know, after that type mm. of thing. I, um, so I built a furnace out of two fire bricks. Yeah, yeah. Like bre yeah. breeze block size. Yeah. And I hollowed out the, the oven in the middle of them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. A hole in it for a, for a, a, the most expensive blowtorch I think you can buy in, in the yeah. shops, you know? Yeah. Um, and I got this thing, I got the blade fired up until it was cherry. Yes. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. a distinct color. You can't mistake yeah. it. You look at it, you're like that. And then it went straight in an ammo can full of, I think it was vegetable oil. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And I'm holding it there thinking, please don't bend. Don't walk. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah, walk. Yeah. Um, and then, after that, I think you further temper it in. I put yes. it in the in the oven. Yeah, again, yeah, yeah. You, have to, you you basically take them up and you take them in layman's terms. You would take them up and take them back down again. You know, yeah. to get things done. But what we are talking about that's that's a lot of information. So, a guy with not a lot of knowledge on that, or would you go and seek help and ask somebody who's been doing it for sixty years, and they know exactly what's been going on about. Mm. Now, they're not producing them for you. They're not doing the blades for you. But these individuals, that's their job. So when you do give them something, you get back what you give them. Does that, does that make sense? Mm. You know, and we, and we don't have the little instances where you put a hell of a lot of effort and work into something. And like you say, you can take it out and it's like a, it's like a boomerang, you know, because you've got something wrong because you didn't know that I don't know, you should have put a, a pinch of salt in there or something like that to counteract this thing, you know. So I looked at everything and I looked at what was available and I thought, well, why not use people as well? Because it's all about helping other industries and businesses out as well. That's how you build a little community of people that, mm. that look after each other. It's not an insular thing. It's not a personal thing, you know. When you're making one dagger or two daggers, well, of course you can have a little... Uh, furnace where you can preheat and do all your treatments and stuff like that. But when you're making batches of 30, it's not feasible, Chris, you know? It's just not feasible. So you've kind of got to get a little bit industrial and you've got to up your level a little bit, hence the reason why you have to get other agencies involved in helping out in the process to get things done. Just like they've always done. That's how they always do it, you know? Fascinating, incredible. I hadn't even, you know, considered. So, John, can you just tell us a bit, because... We get a lot of um, paras watch the show. Yeah. The the Arnhem knife was quite a beautiful one, was it not? Yeah, yeah. Arnhem 44. Of, yeah, it was Arnhem 44. It was a big uh, celebration. Uh, clearly, everybody who's in military circles, they will associate the, the dagger, the commando dagger, with commandos because it was originally conceived for that sort of concept. But it's also fair to point out that as the war progressed and obviously airborne forces were created, the dagger then became, if you fell into the caveat of elite forces, your units could obviously indent to get these things issued to you, which a lot of them have. So when you look at a lot of the old Arnhem footage, you'll see a lot of guys that have actually got daggers on their kit, etc. There's one or two reasons for that. One, the guys got them issued, but two, it's remembering that airborne forces were actually created from commandos. That's the whole point because the, some of the army commando units were then parachute trained. So these guys were obviously issued daggers anyway. Uh, the Arnhem Boys is a huge group. It, we're talking 17, 20,000 guys uh, on Facebook. Obviously, they've got internet connections and stuff as well. Uh, I'm very good friends with a guy called uh, Darren Kay, and he's one of the admins of the, the Arnhem Boys Facebook group. And he approached me and he spoke about uh, Arnhem 44, because... It was a couple of years ago now. Uh, forgive me, I can't remember the exact dates. And they were talking about doing a, char a charity event 
but could I make them a batch of daggers, i.e. 30 daggers? And I thought, it's a bit of a push, because bear in mind is that it's a one-man army. Obviously, I've got a team of friends that help out on the internet and Facebook and stuff, mm -hmm. but the actual guy that gets the majority of the stuff done is myself. So I said, yeah, no problems at all. And we wanted to focus on the parachute regiment itself, uh, the glider pilots, and the reconnaissance uh, I'll call them reconnaissance brigade, but the reconnaissance unit. So it was the three sort of main elements of the airborne forces that went in, and we'd done some of them. So out of that thirty daggers, let's just say uh, seventeen was allocated to parachute regiments. You know, five or six was allocated to each subsequent one. Uh, I got them all made. I informed Darren that they were all made. That was fine. He came a clock uh, across and collected them, took them back, all gone. Literally, they, they went online just within the airborne community. And I think they sold out in probably, I'm going to exaggerate slightly, but I'd say no longer than 36 hours. Mm. Better mind people have got lives. So we're not all online all the time. Everybody's at work and stuff. 36 hours, the entire batches were gone and they went all over the world. So there was that, you're absolutely correct, there was that huge airborne connection as well. You can probably see. There's an airborne belly in the background there that I got off one of the guys who sent me up. I don't, can you see that okay, Chris? On the, yes, you can on the, do, yeah, mate. Yeah. All these things are all things that guys that have sent me uh, through the commando and, and, and the airborne brotherhood. Uh, just as, as a thank you, as, as an acknowledgement of things. So they're more than successful. And then with them daggers as well, they've also got the airborne tulip fund, again, which is done by the Almond Boys. And they've done several daggers, which they have auctioned off. And all, all proceeds, all proceeds go directly to the man, to the charity, for example, for the the tulips, where they go out and they get the, the young Dutch kids and they're, they're planting all the bulbs and stuff in remembrance of the individuals and then they grow up, etc. So, yeah, so it was, it was a big undertaking, but it was absolutely really worth it and a lot of goods came from it. There was a lot of people out there who maybe can't look after themselves anymore, they fell on hard times, etc. And that's the one thing about coming from the military background. We might not be in it anymore, but we can help. We can do something. I can't do a lot of things, but what I can do is make them. And if I have to make one and give it away, that's fine. Because if that's going to buy somebody a tumble dryer who needs one, I'm all for it. Because I'd like to think that maybe the greater world one day, if I fell on bad times, somebody would come and help me. You know, that's just the kind of the way that my philosophy in life is, actually. Mm. You know, give us an idea, John. What uh, what other things? I mean, you you obviously make the commando knife. What what other yeah. things do you get commissioned to make, uh, and, and what sort of scale do you have to produce them at? It's it's mainly unlike uh, a lot of guys that are out there who will go into making. Bowie knives and things like that. I am very niche and I am very specific. I've only really got the one interest and that happens to be making daggers. But when it comes to making daggers, and I can quite comfortably and factually say this, I have made the biggest range of daggers. Mm -hmm. Roped and ribbed, beaded and ribbed, nine bead and six bead, two different variants. Second patterns, bus patterns, the, the, the list goes on. The classic range, ones have been in black, others have been nickel plated. There's nobody else on the planet that's made as many different variants of daggers. And what I kind of get a little kick out of is the original concepts came around in World War II. Having known about it, I've studied them, having owned them, I've studied them, and I've tried to improve on little single things like maybe making the blade a little tad thinner so it's better in the hand, improving the grips slightly by making the knurling just that micron a little bit deeper so you get a better purchase on it, making it a few ounces heavier so you get a better balance on the daggers. Have you ever put a little magnifying glass in the handle Yeah, and a little pair of tweezers that you can pull out? No, 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 not, not as of yet. I, I've got a couple of here that I'll show you. That's the fat boy there. It's basically a second pattern, mm. but as you can see, the grip is a lot thicker. It's actually one of my favourites because it's very, very good in the hand. I, I like a chunkier grip, you see. The last time that was made was during the World War Two. Nobody's ever done it since. I was the first guy to come around to doing that. Obviously, you'll have individuals in the world that have maybe made one since. But, you know, 
in a batch level. Nobody's ever done it, so I've done that. Uh, we've got the, the standard dub pattern that everybody will be uh, familiar with. Again, this is classic range. Now, what does it mean by classic range? It's important at this stage to point out these, these are not reproductions. Th these are originals. Hamilton Dagger's Glasgow's originals. The concept was derived during World War II, and they actually kind of got it right. So where do you go from that? Well, you have to do the same sort of thing because a stiletto, a dagger, is a dagger if you agree, you know? But when you do improvements on it, you've got to get the technical drawings done, you've got to go and visit people in foundries to get things done the way that you want. That's kind of what you can come up with. The classic range is where I've done a range where in tribute and homage to the, the artisans during World War II period and the commandos who used it. The grip, for example, is blackened in the same way that they've done it during that period. So as you can probably see there, Chris, it can, it will patina down, maybe it's a bit mm -hmm. bright, it will patina down so you get that classic World War II look to it. And why do you get the look? Well, that's because the dagger's done the same way. All I've done is refinements. Mm -hmm. When you've got an, a thing that's been refined to the point where it's nearly perfect, there's not a lot of places you can go with it, if that makes sense. But a lot of people get confused with terminology and they say, oh, yeah, that's just a post-war copy. No, it's not a post-war copy. That's a Hamilton Dagger Glasgow. Dagger. That's mm -hmm. original to me. And I've made that. And there must be something in it because everybody wants one. Surely there's a difference between a reproduction and a copy anyway, isn't there? A, a, that, that's absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And, and what it is, it's, it's people's uh, lack of understanding of the terminology, what you just said there. You know, a reproduction is when you take a thing, you microscopically look at it, and you try and imitate and copy everything about that thing to sell it as a copy or a reproduction of that thing. A copy is a little bit flyer. A copy is when you copy it, again, just like a reproduction, but you're selling it as the real thing. Mm. Does it, does it, hence the reason why, fake. You know, people say, oh, yeah, that's a, that, that's a fake dagger, you know. And the materials can be inferior, can't they? It's exactly that. And, th and this is the thing that you've got to embrace. We're not in 1942 anymore. You know, we're in 2023. And the beauty of life, the beauty of science, the beauty of industry, everything has came along. So why not make something better? And here's the thing that got me. I was a part of a brigade for basically the, the most of my life. And the dagger symbolizes everything that's about a, about a commando. It's his heart, his soul, and his blood that pumps through his veins. But here's the irony. They actually don't really get issued them anymore. So everything about them is all dagger oriented, but they don't have one. And I found that was unacceptable. Now, I'm not planning to get some sort of Ministry of Defence, you know, contract type of thing, because I'm not skilled for that. I'm just a bloke that does his thing. But as we were speaking about earlier on, when the communities get slightly smaller and slightly more niche in the SF world, I've sent quite a few mm. to pool to other places, shall we say, that obviously I'm, I'm not going to mention. I reckon if they were to issue all these commandos and the, sc the new Scouts Regiment and the Paras... It if when you passed that training, you got issued a commando knife, I, I reckon, I reckon that would be more worth, war, yeah. worth more personally than your berry. Yeah, um, you're exactly right, and and that's what I thought as well because it, it's quite hard to uh, put into words which things that we're talking about, which is emotions and feelings. You know, you've been there. I know what I've been there. I can't quite put it into it. But that dagger, it's a, it's a rite of passage, isn't it? You know, you've done that, you're getting the berry and stuff, and it's what you've become. And I understand modern rules of conflict, etc. and I understand that, that there is ways to dispatch the enemy, humanely, etc., etc. Things have changed. But every single soldier or every single Marine, Air Force personnel, whatever, Matt Lowe that goes away, they all carry some sort of knife. They go and buy them themselves. So I sort of looked at that and I thought, well, that's actually unacceptable. So I'm going to approach a few people, which brings me on nicely. This is the the Kraken, which is the new HDG second pattern. 
I've changed all the different elements of it. Now, the good thing about this is, I think I've sent you a few pictures across, Chris, where you can probably see a little white dot there, which is actually a luminous. I came up with the concept because during times on opera operations and stuff, even though your kit's packed and you, you've got all your stuff on, and you know where it is, sometimes you just need that little combat indicator, just so when you look down onto your belt kit, you can just see this little tiny glow, and that tells you that that's your, your new best friend. It's just sitting right there. In modern day operations, you've only got a millisecond to make a decision. That light's your millisecond. To locate something so you're not fumbling about in the boxing gloves, a fear go on. You can see what you need to do. You can draw it out. Obviously, the nut, the actual grip itself, the guard and the blade, these are all getting made from different materials, which is one good for the soldier or the marine or the commando or the paratrooper. Aluminium grips, Nice and lightweight, could also be uh, chemically anodized. We're still keeping a mild steel guard because you need some sort of protection. Stainless steel blade, which has been blackened. Uh, your standard steel nut because you still need to retain the strength on it. And obviously uh, the, the aluminous chemicals that we put in the base of it. A little bit lighter than standard, which changed the balance slightly, so I had to change the, uh, the geometrics of the the actual blade itself. So basically when we talk about balance, that's balance. When they talk about a balanced dagger, it's from throwing it from hand to hand and catching it in the same place. If it was unbalanced, it would tumble and it would catch Vicky Berker, you know? Mm. So that's one that we're doing and that's the latest batch. And I can quite comfortably assure you there's a small batch of these which are going south and there's a small batch of these which are going slightly north, you know, as we speak. That's one there that's been finished, but I've just kept it to one side to show you type of thing. So to answer your question, yes, they actually are getting trialed as we as we speak now, mate. Wow, incredible, incredible. Yeah. And can we just, I think it would, wouldn't be fair to end the podcast before talking about Sykes Fairburn. It, yeah. C c c could you explain that? that um, could, yeah, could you expl uh, explain for people at home? Fairburn and Sykes, two separate individuals, uh, two elderly men actually, when, when they became famous they were actually elderly men. Uh, coming from a, basically coming from a police background, when we had the empire, we had the colonies, there was a lot of trouble in certain areas, China being one of the problems, Shanghai in particular. Fairburn and Sykes being uh, policemen and good policemen were sent across there because they had various skills and they learned from the local Chinese population because there was a lot of knife crime etc. So they would pick up little bits of skills from the indigenous population and obviously weapons as well. They come across different types of weapons. And they devised that your, your, your common dagger, which has been around, by the way, a long time before Fairburns and Sykes even thought about a dagger. Knights would have daggers, etc. You know, Romans had daggers. Because funny old thing, a dagger's a dagger and it still looks like a dagger today. A Roman dagger doesn't really look any different from a modern commando dagger, apart from it's been refined a little bit more. So they came up with the concept. World War II started. Uh, these gentlemen were very talented, you know, when it came to the, the unarmed combat and things like that, you know, and using weapons. So in the naivety of the, the early British forces, government at that time, we weren't prepared for World War II, so we had to grab everybody in that we were requiring to help train. They set up, obviously, originally, it was... I think it was Loch Lot. Uh, they went up to, that was before the Commando Training Centre was there, where they'd send in individuals up to be trained. And that's when the knife fighting came into it. Fairburn and Sykes, probably more Fairburn, he was more the, the front man, if that makes sense. Sykes was a slightly more reserved guy in the background. They then got into Locked in with Wilkinson. Wilkinson would invite them down. What do you want? Well, I would like something like this type of thing. They'd make, you know, prototypes, etc. Well, like that. No, you need to refine that a little bit, do this a little bit. And then they sort of came up with the, the classic fuss pattern concept. But when you think about it, really, Wilkinson has been renowned for making uh, small arms, weapons, knives, swords, since they came into existence way back. Obviously, they're no longer in existence now. A fuss pattern dagger is actually a shrunken down version of an 1888 bayonet. If you look at an 1888 bayonet, it's mm. a huge Fairburn and Sykes. 
So they did listen to the guy, but they still done what they've always done. Their guys are trained to make a certain type of thing. So ironically, when this guy said, I'd like this little thing, you know, about a seven inch blade, you know, five inch handle, about 11 inches in total that I can conceal, right? Okay. They go to the grinders and the grinders will produce blanks. These grinders have been making all these 1888 bayonets the whole life. So what do you think the blade came out looking like? A miniaturized 1888 bayonet mm. with a little twick on it, you know? But when it came to the balancing and the handling, that's when it gets more scientific when people actually had to start counting the ounces when they were doing things and making molds for things and trying to get it right. You know, so that's how the Fairburn and Sykes came, uh, came around. People often use the term, in my opinion, uh, a little bit too much. They kind of class every sort of dagger as a Fairburn yeah. and Sykes, you, you know, because it's like, a, it's like a whitewash type of thing, isn't it? Which you're, you're not entirely wrong, but bearing in mind their most influential one was the first pattern. It was only in for a year. People forget that. You know, everybody raves about first patterns and stuff like that. Operationally, it was only around for around about a year. Why? Too much old Victorian type of messing around during a quite a serious war, you know, with the, the s Bend guards and all the fancy etches and stuff. Why did we go to the second pattern? You don't need an s Bend guard, you have a straight guard. I don't need the fancy castle on the blade, and I definitely don't need the fancy etches because that's adding to money, it's adding to manpower, it's adding to time. Refine, refine, refine. When we say refine, we actually mean simplify. The second part came along, which in my opinion is the best fighting knife ever. Absolutely ever. It has been perfected. No matter what you do to it, it's just perfect. And it's just designed to do exactly what it does. Again, that was too much of a hassle as things became slightly more uh, worrying during the war. And they asked them if they could refine that process as well. Now we're going into the mass production because commando training was coming along. We weren't talking small groups of men. I think we were talking over 26,000 over the whole period, you know. That's when the classic third part and dagger, i.e. this one that everybody recognises with the rings, the ribs around it, that came in. And they were basically produced from moulds. So, yes, they did simplify it. But that was because it was a necessity to be simplified, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of inspired me to look back at these things that they've done in homage, not to recreate, to make something, but improve upon it. If you're going to do something, try and improve upon it. But keep the standards to the same. Standards is everything. You know, and my classic thing is, if it's not good enough for me, it's not good enough for you. That's it. You know, this is what I carried in the Marines. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I had one myself. Yeah, yeah. Is that a little? Uh, is that a parachute tag on, on that? Is yeah, it? that's your your parachute yeah. release. What do you call it? Like your la your weak weakest link, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So friends at home, that's what pull that bit there is. What pulls your parachute out? I think many of us, when we did our jumps course, you grab your last one as a, a little token, a, as a souvenir that you pass your course. Um, that's the original holder. I think I have my Normark knife in it, which is what all Marines used to carry. Normark be, being a Norwegian brand, I always loved the Swiss Army knife. Yeah, particularly in black because it's just that bit different, and um, and so yeah, so that's that's actually my replacement. The first Swiss I mean, I've got a bit battered, but uh, yeah, that's what I, I mean. Because it's funny. The great thing about being in the Marine, what 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 one really good thing is, unless it's changed now, you're still allowed to carry a knife. Yeah, of course, yes, yeah, yeah. Unlike this, the state of this country now, where you know, because they're deemed a danger and which let's be honest, they are, they in inner city violence, they are young people can't carry not, not, I mean, it is, it would never stop me go, you know, obviously I take my knife when I go camping or if, if I go to the woods with my son, we take a machete and a, our bushcraft knives. Well, to it, used, it used to be back in the day, I mean, long, long, long before our time, when uh, young young kids they were given pen knives and stuff like that, mm. you, you know that was part and parcel because we were outside a lot more. You know, back in the fifties, sixties and stuff like that, all, all young kids had pen knives and stuff. But yeah, 
Absolutely. Carry a knife, save a life is, is the better my, way of looking at it. My son's first birthday present, John, was a knife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my, my son's a grown man now, but you can imagine with, with me being his dad, all, all the way through the things that I was picking up throughout my career, you know, he, he's been spoiled when it comes to uh, war trophies and things like that, you know. And the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, have you ever thought about or have you been to Japan? I've, I've, I've not been to Japan. I, I've, I've known a, a couple of good friends uh, who have actually, been, believe it or not, been stationed uh, in Japan. It is something now that I'm, uh, I'm maybe contemplating and doing uh, slightly later on because it's a, it's a completely different world, isn't it? Mm. You know? They've got two wicked museums in Tokyo. One's just outside the city, um, and that's where it's the history of the katana, so the yeah. history of the samurai sword. Yeah, yeah. And it shows you, it's just incredible to see how they used to pile the coke onto the iron, get the iron ore from the rock, you know, yeah. a special way to do it, special furnace that drops, the, the collect the iron ore at the bottom of the furnace, yeah, yeah. And they sprinkle coke onto it, not that kind of coke, folks. The yeah, yeah. coal, coal, yeah. burn coal to put to put the carbon in. Yeah. Then then they they hammer it into a little square block. Then they fold fold it, and then they hammer it, and they fold. They said to, well, if Highland, the film Highland, is anything to believe, they would fold their blades anything up to a thousand times. I think that might be a bit extreme. Yeah, a, a, a little bit of a push. A little yeah. bit of a push. And in the in Tokyo itself, there's the National Museum, and it's it is so many katanas in there, and they're just in incredible, yeah. incredible yeah. to think that they produce to the standard you do, and vice versa, but they did it Doesn't with no with, with no modern machinery. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing. This is the evolution of things. These smiths. You know, they, they would have been around, as we know, for thousands of years producing these items because they're a, they're a warring people. You know, they're, all, they're always armed. It's, it's in their culture, it's in their society. Not so much now, but it was back then. A lot of rival clans fighting with each other. So you needed people to do it. But as time's gone on and industries caught up with it, the Western world, shall we say, they can do all that stuff in a day because they'll just smell all the stuff industrially. Everything will get banged out. But it's not quite the same. And I think there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of these uh, original Smiths that are actually struggling now to find apprentices, you know, because it's it's almost like a that sadly, it's almost like a dying art, you know. But they'll but they'll take like a month just to produce the steel, you know, to make for the, the actual blade. And the whole thing to do might take up to a year for that one off sword. And that's that's the, the complete craftsmanship of it. Mm. It's that individual who's master of none, but jack of all. If that, he knows all the different processes and he's, he's specified in each one. And as an individual for myself, that's kind of what I have to do. It's a bit like uh, when, when you're talking about the daggers, so not only have I got to grind blades, but I've got to understand how to polish blades, how to put an edge on blades, how to buff a blade, what grit do you use? When you're more industrial, you've got certain departments that deal with all those subcategories, you know. As an individual, as an artisan, I've got to do all of that myself, and the end result is that. All those different mm -hmm. levels to produce that. Everything from the nut to the tip. Understand every element and how to do it all. That's beyond, the difference. It's beyond words, mate. It's That's beyond words. A bit more money, you know? have, have you got Japanese whetstones? I actually, believe it, believe it or not, I've not used them yet, but I did. Uh, my future son-in-law, actually, was about a Christmas ago, he actually bought me some, and it's got a little wooden type of a uh, hole that you put it in to stop it yeah, moving yeah, about, yeah. you know, that type of stuff. They did intimidate me slightly, I must admit. I've never used them, because I've never actually felt the need to use them on currently what I'm doing. But uh, there is a few kitchen knives that, uh, that need to get sorted out, and I'm, I'm probably going to, when I'm a little bit freer, I'm probably going to do a few of them. And yeah. give them a good, a good sharpen up and a good clean, you know? Yeah, I learned the knife sharpening from Ray, Ray watching Ray Mears' videos. Yeah. 
and he yeah, said yeah. you've got to get these japanese whetstones so i bought i bought a load on ebay or something um absolutely fascinating chatting we're going to put all your links below um, so folks out there, if you've got anything, you you know, if you want to commission some daggers from John, get in contact, Absolutely. get in contact just to discuss your, discuss your needs. I'm sure if John can't do it, he'll know the person that can. <laughs> no, absolutely. And that goes for yourself as well, Chris. Any of things that you're doing, mate, please let me know if I can help. I will help. You know that. Yes. I have something to ask you after the show. <laughs> no, that's fine, mate. That's absolutely no problems at all. I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I have. Massive thank you to, to John and uh, Hamilton Daggers Glasgow. If you could like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.